All right, welcome every, everyone. We've got February 2023 here, believe it or not. Ask us anything, FFL, JB and JC at your service. Uh, two big topics, going over 4473 training, as well as your uh, arm stabilizer brace understanding and everything we know about that. Um, if we saw you at SHOT Show, thank you, thank you, thank you. We, hit, we shook hundreds of hands. Uh, had some fun laughs with a few of you, uh, had dinner or no, lunch with several others. So again, thanks for uh, stopping by and tracking us down. It was kind of crazy with, uh, I think there was 53,000 FFLs there and uh, 2,800 booths to get through. So that was a, a lot of fun. If you've never been to SHOT Show, we highly, highly, highly suggest it for next year, January, every year. Um, if you notice on the screen, uh, JC, just give me an okay if you see my screen. Good to go. All right. Uh, notice on our screen, we've got new phone numbers. JC and JB have actually um, expanded our service so that we can answer your phone call every day, anytime. Uh, it'll roll from me to myself to JC. If one of us is busy, the other guy answers. So uh, it's great that you know both of us. There's our new direct dial numbers. Our old numbers will continue to work. Don't worry about that. Our old cell numbers, if you've been calling them, will work. The uh, main number, 720-336-0028, write that down. That's a great service that uh, actually um, gives you a choice of options, depending on the topic you're asking about, the information you need, and the expert. Yes, JC and I claim to be experts. Uh, it'll direct to the right person based on what you're asking about. So uh, we'll give you this information again at the end. So um, just make note of our new cell numbers if you want that. Okay, again, old cell numbers will continue to work. All right, all right, what are we going through today? Real quick, down and dirty, new 4473, critical for uh, an upcoming April 1st launch, mandatory launch. Uh, you do not need to be using it today. I know a lot of you are. We'll get through that in a minute. Um, after we get through 4473, we'll get through the ATF ruling 2021 ROAF, the arm stabilizer arm brace, everything you need to know and what you don't want to do. All right, and then the updates, will give you some updates on inspections, revocations, and get it right the first time, uh, what you need to know to be successful in your FFL business. All right, JC, we got uh, a lot in the, in the waiting room. Do you see that? I don't see the waiting room. Oh, I got I, it, okay, I got it. Let me uh, get these folks in. Yeah. Hang on guys, got about another 50 people joining us. Um, <clears throat> All right, if you're just joining us, uh, you can catch the recording intro uh, that we'll download and send to you guys later this week. But if you have questions, uh, we'll get to those at the end. We wanna get through a lot of information in the time allotted, but you can certainly use the chat function on Zoom right at the bottom of your screen, you should see that. Please type in your questions as we go along. And again, we'll get to those uh, at the end and try to get everybody answered. And again, the session is being recorded. All right, back to the ATF 4473. It's available on the ATF website. You can download it. You can start using it. Uh, a lot of you have by mistake, maybe. This whole issue uh, came up on December 6th when someone at the ATF was nice enough to accidentally post the proposed 4473 with its, with its changers. Confused a lot of us out there. Um, Lo, lo and behold, we found out it wasn't intended to be launched in the way it has, but it is out there and for use by you now. Here's a disclaimer. The uh, 4473 is still subject to change by the ATF. It may not be in its final form. If you are printing off these forms, we, you know, don't print too many. It can change before the end of the month. They still have executive re review and general and, and, and legal review of the form in its entirety, including the instructions. So it might change a little bit. Uh, uh, you can order these now. There's actually uh, paper forms that have been printed and been distributed. We, we're hearing of those getting uh, received by, by FFLs who placed some early orders. Uh, here's the um, what you must know. It must be in use by April 1st of this year. You do not need to be using the 4473 in the new form at all right now. So even though the ATF said use, they recommend using immediately, you do not need to do that. Okay. Uh, our training today is going to focus on the uh, any major concerns or issues. We will tell you there are no major construct changes or format changes to the 4473. Uh, just some things to understand and what some of the new uh, questions ask for. 
uh, let's see, uh, the form has been revised primarily to coincide with the safe, the, the bipartisan Safe Communities Act, uh, looking at transfers to folks 21, under 21 years of age, and as well as the 10-day uh, 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 the extended delay, if necessary, by either next or by your state agencies, and how to manage that, that process. There is a lot of text updates that we're going to go over that are pretty important, and we'd like to make sure you guys all understand and know about them. So, and we will have online, we'll have, a, aside from this webinar, everyone who's attended today will receive uh, access to our online training that is hopefully due out soon for your new employees to understand how to manage and navigate the 4473 process. So what's new? Um, long story short, uh, section A, not very new, uh, not, not, not a lot of changes, but right at the top, you can highlight, we highlighted all the changes for you to understand. And again, it's being recorded for employees who are missing this presentation. But that first warning notice, they've extended the 10-year criminal prosecutable uh, time in prison for you to, for, for lying on this form as a firearm transferee or customer from 10 years to 15, as if 10 wasn't enough. Uh, it's now 15 years uh, threat of imprisonment and a $250,000 fine if you are buying a firearm for somebody other than yourself and making any false representations on this form. Secondly, up there at the top right corner, they've simply taken the word serial out of the top right corner uh, designated box where you were priorly using the transaction serial number uh, for referencing or keeping track of your firearms. Now it just says transaction number, if any. Uh, this is nice, it's less confusing. A lot of gun dealers uh, will use different types of numbers in that box referencing maybe gun tags on the firearms on display, or maybe a location where that firearm was pulled from. But now it's just a very simply transaction number, if any, that you use to keep record uh, and traceability in your store. Um, this number is important, very important, if you have any systemic way to manage your form using these numbers to make sure they coincide with those numbers in the disposition side of your a and book. If you're still using these numbers instead of writing addresses for your transferee uh, customer addresses. All right. So minor there, but little text, text changes. All right, moving on to section A, filled out by you, the FFL. Uh, this is coinciding with the new um, marking ruling that came out back in August with the privately manufactured firearms. If you do have a PMF, as they're known as, you must be indicating such in section A, box one, and making sure that firearm is not only um, identified as a PMF, personally or privately manufactured firearm, but also that it is serialized appropriately as required by the new marking ruling. Uh, we're, we're not recommending to any FFL who calls us to take in PMFs at this point, unless you qualify to do so, ready to do so, ready to stamp, these firearms and uh, log them appropriately in your books and take on the responsibility of someone who has built a gun, uh, especially on the pawnbroker side, or if you're buying a used gun, you can't uh, guarantee any quality warranty or functionality at a firearm and you absorb the liability if you go ahead and bring one of those firearms into your place of business. But PMF is required if it's a, basically a ghost gun that someone built and it needs to have a serial number. Okay. That process introduces it into the whole FFL tracing system. Also, Section A, uh, down at Box 8, if any of you are doing private party transfers, you now have to indicate, um, obviously, if any part of this transaction relates to a, a private party transfer. Now, it's a simple little word change, uh, but long story short, you could have different guns on your 4473. One, one might be a private party transfer firearm for a customer. One might be a new firearm that person, maybe that customer is purchasing or used gun, could be a pawn redemption. We are, you know, when folks call us and ask us about private party transfers and we help them walk, you know, walk through it, it's, 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 it's re required in many states, not all, but some they probably will be coming to a state near you. Uh, there's a whole ATF pamphlet available on how to do this, but we tell everyone, do not include a, a, a private party transfer firearm on the same 4473 as you would for a new or used firearm for that same customer because 
when you're doing a private party transfer, you are not taking acquisition of that firearm from the seller, from, from, from neighbor A who's selling it to neighbor B. You're not taking acquisition of that firearm until you actually get a proceed from your background check agency. Therefore, if you get a delay on a customer and they also have a, a used a new gun on this 4473, you know, that customer may want to come in and pick up that other firearm as soon as they get a proceed, which might be tomorrow or later today. They might want to come in and pick up both firearms, but hence you only have one. You don't have, you do not have the firearm involved in a private party transfer. Uh, you'll have to wait on disposing of this firearm in most software platforms. Most platforms will not let you proceed or transfer to a, one firearm on a 4473. You have to transfer all of them at the same time to, to get a proper disposition on those firearms involved in the uh, disposition. So long story short, if you're doing private party transfers, do not add any other firearms to those 4473s. Do them separately. Explain to the customer you need to do, do, need to do them separately for, for dis disposition reasons. Box 10 or line 10 where the transferee or customer is asked if they reside in the city limits. Most customers may know this, but if they don't, there's a box that says unknown. You do not need to coach your counsel on this, and you don't need to help them on this if they simply do not know if they reside within their city limits, they check unknown. This new box will assist FBI or your point of contact state agency to notify local law enforcement when a felon attempts to purchase a firearm when they were obviously told not to do that. Again, this is uh, part of a new Biden uh, Safe Communities Act program where FBI NICS or state agencies must notify local law enforcement within 24 hours. Hence, this box will help them ex expedite that part of their process. Uh, back over to section B. Uh, question 21A for the customer has, uh, ex has changed the question where it used to ask if you are the actual buyer of this fire or the firearm listed. Now it's asking if you're the actual buyer of all of the firearms listed. Okay. Uh, we don't know why this is, is, has changed. I mean, the text doesn't really expand responsibility or liability, but they have changed that, those, that wording. But more importantly, on section, uh, in section B, Question 20A is complemented by these new questions. 21B, uh, I'll read it and, and explain it briefly. It says, do you, not only uh, is 21A asking if you're buying this firearm for yourself, but now 21B says, do you intend to purchase or acquire any firearm listed on this form and any continuation sheets or ammunition? That's interesting. Uh, for sale of this disposition to any person described in questions 21C through M, which are the disqualifying questions or the persons described in 21 and one, which are the alien immigrant, immigrant questions. So the obvious answer to, to this question is no. We're not buying that firearm for any other person other than ourselves. And we're not buying a, this firearm for somebody listed below. Uh, it's an obscure question, but you know, it's, it, it just deepens the liability for that customer who might be lying. Uh, if that person is prosecuted later, and has completed this form, it really basically deepens the, the liability and responsibility of that person for relying on this, on this question and possibly selling that to a friend or buying it for the purposes of selling it to somebody or providing it to somebody for whom it should not be intended. Okay, just basically a complimentary question to, to 21A. Then we go to 21C. And it says, do you intend to sell or otherwise dispose of any firearm listed on this form in any continuation sheet or ammunition in the furtherance of any felony or other offense punishable by imprisonment for a term of more than one year, a federal crime of terrorism, or a drug trafficking offense? A lot of, a lot of language there, but essentially asking the same thing. Are you acquiring this firearm for someone else? Again, expands on question 21A, and we do want to make sure they answer no to this question. All right. Self-explanatory, but you know why we don't we haven't gotten a straight answer on this, except it really does hold that person much more responsible if ever um, if ever called into question for a prosecution of maybe a straw purchase. All right. 21N1 and 21N2 are your alien immigration questions. Uh, the numbers have changed based again on those 
uh, questions that were added that we just reviewed. So we have 21N instead of 21L. And right there uh, in highlight, they've added this little sentence that says US citizens and nationals have 20, leave 21N1 and 21N2 blank. Not only was this confusing for the last five or seven years that we've been dealing with this, um, if you guys remember back, we had that little NA box. Now they say just leave it all blank. And we do know that citizens uh, will go ahead and mark these no. Uh, in the case of marking both of these no, it is expected that those get corrected and uh, you know, with a straight line through an initial and date. But it's better if you just warn your customers ahead of time that if the citizens, they leave 21N1 and 21N2 blank. And we don't see any issue with highlighting that question as you see here, take a highlighter, mark that up if you're, uh, if you're using paper forms and or include that in your um, process before you have your customers complete the 4473s. Remind them of that question. Leaving it checked as a no shouldn't result in any critical violations of having the forms completed as the ATF today does not see that as a major issue when uh, they're doing inspections, but if we can prevent it from happening, all the better. Uh, Section B at the bottom in the uh, certification warning here for the customer, they've changed the language to say, I further understand that the repetitive purchase of firearms for the purpose of resale to predominantly earn a profit without a federal firearms license is a violation of federal law. If you read into that, this is going after those folks who are buying uh, firearms, reselling them maybe at flea markets or gun shows, or privately uh, going into the business without a license, you know, whether it be five guns a year or 10 guns a year or 20 guns a year. The ATF has never stipulated when you are actually in the business without a firearms license. And this just pre pre basically presents much more latitude to the firearms dealer uh, or the firearm ATF for um, prosecuting those folks in the business of selling firearms repeatedly and predominantly to earn a profit. Very interesting word. Uh, we'll have to watch case law on this one. All right, over into section C, up at the top here, this is important. If you're doing gun shows, box 25, and that is now not only asking for the name of the function in the county, it's asking for the address, city, state, and zip code. Uh, why? Uh, well, this is to help you make sure you send any, any 3310.4s or 12s to the respective county chief law enforcement officer or agency where they are required to be filed. Remember, if you're doing a, a gun show in a county other than where you are licensed, you have to go ahead and send that those, those copies of those forms off the respective uh, supervisor of the county for law enforcement. So, and then when the ATF comes in and reviews your forms, believe me, they will be looking at these counties and these dates to see if they are, if you are abiding by the, the rule as it's always been stipulated, or, and if you're sending them to the right place as listed on your 3310.4. So if you're doing gun shows, this one is big for you. Uh, also for those events that are, that are authorized off, off sites such as um, you know, Elks Club and, and, and the NR, NRA events where you might be transferring firearms. All right, section C, this is where it gets starts to get the nitty gritty for why this entire form had to be updated. Uh, look at the notice in uh, 27 above 27A is stipulating that if the transferee of buyer is under 21, a waiting period of up to 10 days may apply where notification from next or your state agency has been received within that three day business, three, within three days to further the um, Brady date hold to 10 days. All right. And as a reminder in that too, it says a next check is only valid for 30 calendar days from the date recorded in question 27A. As a reminder, uh, that 30 day countdown starts the day after the date of 27A. It doesn't start on the date of 27A. So if I do my next background check today, I start counting tomorrow. Okay. And ATF is putting these a lot of reminders in here about this because so many folks have been revoked on this issue, and you know they're getting a little 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 mud in their face, an egg on their face because they they're backtracking to revocations from this past year, and saying we're going to allow this to slide for now because people couldn't count 30 or 31. 
uh, and they were making errors and we were revoking licenses and they have. Uh, but now they're making it very clear going forward as of the issuance of this form that you better be smart and uh, use a calendar when you're counting those 30 days and make sure you're checking the next ENIX update system and update screen to make sure that expiration date is correct. All right, telling us, they're telling us two or three times throughout this form about this 30 day issue. Uh, down on 27C, again, there, um, you know, you have the delayed date there with the uh, date you can transfer on if you don't hear back from the ATF, the Brady expiration date. But it also says if time permit, if time period is not extended by next or the appropriate state agency. So this 10 day, 10 day issue and this 30 day issue must be critical uh, in the eyes of all of your employees completing transfers and handing out firearms. Question 27C, uh, here's, here's where we really get into the, um, uh, the, the under 21 issue. They've got a whole new box for us. Um, they've, ex they've expanded it obviously to the length of the page. Uh, but the first thing I wanna go ahead and show you in this box is the overturned stipulation here. If you have an overturned uh, uh, decision, and you have a you have a uh, an AMD notification from a local court, or Nix has called you. They will give you the date on which they provided the overturned decision to you. So please, they have a date line. There was never a date line. You can plug that in there. Uh, and then obviously you got the box. There's one box for no response within three business days. That that's always been there. That's standard. That should apply to everyone 21 and over. And then we've got these new boxes, notice of additional delay of transferee under 21 years of age. Uh, when did you receive that notification? Again, you're going to get this notification by phone, but you also must be checking your next status update screens on any delays and make sure those dates have not changed. I guarantee you, you we're going to have somebody miss a phone call or the ATF's not going to call and say they did or left a message with so-and-so. Uh, on any delay, make sure you're checking the, that status screen and make sure you put the date in here when you are notified and put the new date of release in that second slot. Put that 10 day date that they provide to you or you see in your next status update screen, jot it in here. We also say, put it in box 32 so you don't make a mistake. We'll get to that in just a minute. If you're getting any extended delays and even your 30 date ex expiration, it's great to put those dates also in box 32 and you'll see why as I get to that section. Uh, then the bottom line here says no response was provided within 10 business days after additional delay for transferring a buyer under 21 and not, uh, years of age. Here's the second box for releasing a firearm. If you so desire, after that 10-day Brady date has expired due to the person being 18, 19, or 20 years old. All right, I know a lot of you are doing this already. You should have been doing this since we talked about this um, back in the fall, uh, since they launched this, this, this requirement, but now you have the paperwork. Uh, areas to fill the information in, and please make sure you get those dates correct. All right, just so you know, they removed in Section C 27 F and G, which allowed you to put the Brady date information or the Brady or the Brady information here. Um, this is uh, where we used to call in the phone uh, NICS checks. Uh, you used to have to put all this information in. They finally removed it from the form because so many fewer people are using the phone. If you're still using it and you want to notate who you talk to, you can certainly put that information in box 32 on form 4473. All right. Next, section E. This is where you are, uh, this is where you, the transfer or is certifying the form after it's completed. They, they added this language and this is important. It says, I further certify that the firearm transfer is within 30 days from the date of initial contact with NICS. Again, they've had so many revocations on this one violation this year that they're backtracking a little bit for those that were revoked. They may be reinstating licenses. We also yet to see that. But at SHOT Show, our new director of ATF said they are going to look at this as a, as a minor versus a major infraction for those revocations in the past. But based on the fact that we're seeing all of this language in the new form, we don't expect that to be uh, uh, any type of um, non-violation for, for the fact of rev revocation or, or subject to revocation going forward. So please make sure, please make sure you're using your calendar, you're checking your, your NICS status screen for those expiration dates on background checks. 
can't reiterate that enough. Form 4473, instructions. Uh, just a couple of things we'll mention here. Um, first on question A, private party transfer, we talked about PMF being required uh, to be marked properly. In 21K, uh, which is the qualifying questions, we have expanded the domestic violence question to include dating, former dating relationships. There's a lot of instruction, major instructions on this, uh, expanded to explain all of the, the, the do's and don'ts, basically. And this is for the customer. So please don't try to be an attorney. Don't try to interpret everything that's written there. If anyone is asking about uh, a non-spousal, non-marriage type of domestic partner relationship where they may have been arrested or charged with any type of domestic violence, point them to the instructions and uh, let them try to figure it out. Very complicated language, but fully, it's all there. <laughs> it's all there. All right, next background check, question 27, is 22nd, second paragraph one, he says, you should not contact, this is for you, the FFL, you should not contact Nix and must stop the transfer. If, if any of the uh, qualifying questions are answered yes to, if they admit to being a bad person, if they admit, admit to being a prohibited person, and or during your conversation where you're qualifying that person, you believe that trans transfer to not be for them. Maybe it's a straw purchase attempt. Maybe it's a situation where they're not going to be, be the future possessor of that firearm. Please be careful. You will be held accountable. Straw purchases are at the top of the radar for ATF. And we, we don't want to just go ahead and transfer because we had a next proceed. Uh, it's saying, don't even bother doing a background check if you believe this person's prohibited. Um, we've through, again been through a lot of hearings this year for revocations, and some of the defense language from the FFL has been, well, I got a background check, I didn't think or I didn't know they were prohibited, uh, even though I did the form properly, I didn't know or I didn't qualify or they didn't tell me. Well, a lot of that is being uh, micromanaged now through language in the instructions and the requirements of proving in interest and intent on that purchase to make sure it's not a straw purchase. Uh, you, again, for the FFL, second warning, it says, even if the transferor or seller has complied with the federal background check requirements, even if you have done everything correct, even if that form looks 100% correct, if you did not prevent a straw purchase, you can still be held accountable. Again, we're, fine, we're, we're getting a lot of accusations through revocations this year where the FFL does not have corporate responsibility, doesn't have a good policy or program in place in writing that says they verify interest and intent on every transferee before they sell it. So there you go. That's a, a quick down and dirty of the changes. Again, nothing major, just some extra boxes to fill in. But as always, we recommend with every FFL employee, RP, uh, anyone who's making handling firearms or doing a transfer, take this new form, you know, you can take it now, you can print it off the website, have every employee read it A to Z, cover one to cover page one to six and a half it is, page seven. Uh, it's a little longer, it's much more detailed, asking for a few more details from you before you proceed with a transfer. I, we, we suggest having every employee and staff sign off and initial this, a copy of it, put it in, in their file so that you can prove you did training with your employees when the new form came out and you can hold your employees accountable for doing so. Uh, there is a, a, there's some defense in that, and that's the greatest way for every employee to understand what they're responsible for, and that they, as an employee, can go to jail or be charged with a criminal offense on top of the FFL if something goes wrong. So uh, again, we'll be answering questions on this at the end. We're gonna jump real fast into our next section. So keep those questions uh, coming in the chat box. <clears throat> All right, ruling 2021R08, uh, the beloved arm brace that's been driving us nuts for the last four to six weeks. This went into effect on 131 of 23. So as of January 31st, 23, that's when it was submitted to the Federal Register. And as ATF stated, uh, that is uh, the date that the new ruling went into effect. So... Hey, JB, can you change the slide, please? I'm getting in here. Zoom, zoom, zoom. There we go. All right. Next slide. All 
Uh, so DOJ has uh, amended the definition of a rifle and has included a little bit more language, but basically it comes down to this, is that firearm designed, redesigned, intended, made, or remade uh, to be full, sh sh fired from the shoulder. So you have to take a real discerning look at the firearm, make the determination whether or not you could fire it from the shoulder. Even if it has a blade on it, their position is that the blade has enough surface area, and we'll get into that. So you really have to take a look at that. All right. Adding to the definition that provides surface area that allows the weapon to be fired from the shoulder provided other factors. So some other factors have to exist as well. But this is all included now in the definition of a rifle. Now, what's surface area? Everybody asks that question. And you'll see picture number four uh, from the left there. That's a blade. Well, they consider that enough surface area to be full shoulder fired. So, I mean, that's how minute they are looking at this. Uh, the other ones listed there are, you know, some other issues. Those all indicate enough surface area. So the next factor you have to take into consideration is the weight and length. So... Uh, and in addition to that, that length of pull from the trigger to the back of that brace uh, fully extended. If that extends further than 13 and a half inches, they consider that to be an SBR. All right. Is the firearm equipped with sights or a scope that provides eye relief? That's another big one, right? So if you have a, you know, a three magnification uh, scope on there, or even uh, some particular sites, if they provide eye relief, or their use would be intended to be used uh, from a shoulder fired position. So you have to take those into consideration. Next slide. Other factors continued, whether the surface area that allows the weapon to be fired from the shoulder is created by a buffer tube, receiver extension, or any other accessory component or other rearward attachment that is necessary for the cycle of operation, all right? So whether the manufacturer, and these last two are really interesting, direct or indirect marketing. So here's the situation with this. There was a manufacturer who had placed a bid for a government contract, did not win that bid, but that manufacturer reutilized the same marketing materials for civilian release. So they basically took the, the marketing materials that they uh, used for the government proposal and they just reused it when they wanted to go after the civilian market so um, there's your direct or indirect marketing the other one is information demonstrating the likely use of the weapon in the general community that's youtube social media so if anybody's produced a video or done any type of marketing materials on youtube on facebook um, and that firearm is being shoulder fired with that arm brace on it that counts so be aware of that as well. So a lot of stipulations here as it relates to that. The important thing is um, that the rule does not affect stabilizing braces in general. Stabilizing braces are an accessory. If they're not included with the firearm, if you're not selling the stabilizing brace or uh, arm brace with the firearm, then they are just an accessory and they are not regulated. The rule doesn't affect... Uh, firearms that have a rifle barrel length of 16 inches or greater and an overall length of 26 inches. This is actually one of the fixes, okay? So you could actually take an AR pistol with an arm brace and just put on a new rifle, uh, a new barrel, a new upper, and you could actually make this firearm 26 inches or greater with a 16 inch barrel, and it removes it from any necessity to have the, the Form 1 or Form 2 submitted for that firearm. So, and the rule doesn't affect anything with a smooth bore, fire, smooth bore firearms. That's your shotguns, your, your TAX 14s, that's your, your um, uh, Mossberg, uh, what's the Mossberg 500 or 590? Shockwave. Uh, the Shockwave, any of that. So it doesn't impact those. We've gotten a lot of questions about those. This is a rifled barrel only. So keep that in mind. What do we got next? Uh, who's affected by the rule? Obviously, if it's a firearm with an arm brace on it, uh, unlicensed possessors are impacted. You as an FFL are impacted, uh, whether you're a, a type one, type two, type seven, uh, there's things that you need to do uh, during this amnesty period to get things taken care of. Uh, under the GCA, 
<clears throat> and under the NFA. So, and then obviously, if you deal with government entities at all, they still fall under the purview of this. So, if they have any of these firearms with the arm braces, they need to take the appropriate steps as well. So, first and foremost, what you need to do is evaluate the firearm. And what we're telling everybody is take the arm braces off, just take them off. There's got to be at least a dozen, if not more, lawsuits right now. Take them off, put them aside. You're supposed to render them so they can't be reattached. Um, you know, as it stands right now, if you have these things in your inventory, you need to take action right now, okay? So you need to evaluate the firearm. You need to look at that surface area. You need to make that determination. Go back one. Thanks. You need to make that determination if that um, surface area provides the adequate structural support to allow the firearm to be fired from the shoulder. I will tell you right now, the vast majority of them do. Um, they got a little bit uh, crazy with developing these things and selling them, and they just kept going further and further and not seeking uh, approval. They got one approved, and then bing, bang, boom, they just start making them willy-nilly. So um, the vast majority of them uh, are definitely have enough surface area. So you need to see if they actually extend past a certain point as well. So that length of pull we talked about, if it extends past that 13 and a half inches, it's considered uh, a shoulder fired or the potential to be shoulder fired. Uh, with the surface area and the brace position, so that's that length of pull, right? A means to the user to firmly brace the firearm and easily aim with stability by uh, placing it into their shoulder or use their shoulder. And with the surface area of the user, uh, encountering the muzzle rise by transmitting recoil straight into the user's body. So these are all um, you know, important factors to assess. Secondary factors, does that pistol have sights that provide eye relief? Talked about that. Does the pistol have sights that would require the shooter to shoulder the firearm? Is the length of trigger pull compatible with that of a rifle? That's that over 35 inches. Is the design weight and length compatible to a similar design SBR? And there's a number of examples provided by the ATF in their FAQs. Has the manufacturer marketed or promoted the pistol with the arm brace, with it being shoulder fired? And then has the arm, bra uh, arm brace pistol configuration been displayed on any media platform? So YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, as an SBR, as a right, uh, uh, being used as a rifle. So those are all contributing factors you need to take into consideration. So, so JC, the, the, correct me if I'm wrong, is the secondary factors are only to be considered if the arm brace is still in place? Exactly, yes. Okay, so no arm brace, don't worry about the rest of these things. Exactly. Okay. All right, type one and type two FFLs, uh, the NFA requirements, um, and if you don't hold a class one or class two SOT, should isolate your retail inventory, any repairs, anything in pawn, et cetera, and definitely take those arm braces off. Um, we're telling all our type two pawn brokers, uh, if you have them in pawn, try to get the customer in to take it off. The reason being is I don't want you taking the liability of screwing up their firearm and tell them to take it home with them, but also advise them. Hey, if you reattach this as a firearm, uh, you are <laughs> going to be in possession of an SBR and, and give them insights into what they need to do. Yeah. And guns with barrels measuring less than 16 inches with any stabilizing brace attachment should be the primary focus. If it has a 16 inch barrel and, and is over 26 inches in length, you don't need to worry about anything. Yeah. Okay. And again, you questions. can certainly go back and replace those barrels if you'd like. Yeah, we, we were just on a, another group call, guys, and, and they were asking us today when, you know, when do they have to take the braces off for the pawn firearms? And the answer was uh, January 31st. Yep. So just because you had them in pawn, if you're a pawnbroker or had them in the back room or in stock, I mean, you are not, you don't have any leeway till May 31st. That's for customers. That's for non-licensees. Licensees had, were, were due to have this in effect on February 1st. Just so everyone's clear on that one. All right, so steps for you to take right now, obviously look at your inventory and make sure you don't have anything that fits into this, the spectrum of an SBR. Uh, any pistols with arm braces attached uh, can be defined as SBRs under the new ruling. So be aware of that, you will be held accountable. Initiate the form one process. This is for type one and type twos. For registering AR pistols with an attached arm brace as SBRs, Again, this is a, a amnesty period and the tax is being waived. 
So if you want to keep it as an SBR, you certainly can do that. Uh, otherwise, remove that arm brace uh, and buffer tubes unless the tube is required for the functionality of the firearm. So if, if it's like a CZ Scorpion, if you have some sort of device on there uh, that is not, you know, for the functionality of the firearm, it's just, you know, purely an accessory uh, for aesthetics, you need to remove that as well. Um, and then the removed arm braces cannot be provided to a customer who's transferring AR pistol or other similar platform pistol that can accommodate a stabilizing arm brace. So you need to be aware of these things. All right. So yeah, during the uh, amnesty period, if you file your form one, make sure that you keep evidence of your submission. If you have filed the form one and you have evidence of that submission, you're good to go. You don't need to do anything else. You don't need to take it off until you get the form one back. The, the, only, the only problem with that, folks, is um, you can't sell that firearm until you get the form one approved That's and correct. then transfer that SBR, you know, now at SBR, until, on the form four. And there's a whole lot of paperwork, details, coordination, et cetera, in that process if you're not already an NFA dealer. So, uh, again, our suggestion is take the arm brace off. Yeah. And we also have two ATF inspections started last week that we're monitoring with our clients. And the first thing they did uh, after they sat down and said, hello, they said, uh, you have, because they looked as they entered the store, they said, uh, you have some SBRs out there you're not supposed to have. Uh, we're going to get settled in here and you may want to go take care of those. So we, there was leniency last week by ATF and IOIs. We're not sure you're going to have leniency this week if you're not acting on this timely. All right, so between now and May 31st, May 31st is that drop dead date. You have to have your Form 1 submission in by May 31st, all right? Ensure all AR pistols and in inventory with stabilizing arm braces attached. If you're gonna keep them as SBRs, you get that document filed, whether it be the Form 1 or Form 2, uh, which the Form 2 is pertinent to manufacturers. Uh, qualifying SBRs that have Form 1 submitted may be sold and transferred using a Form 4, but only once you get that Form 1 back and approved, all right? Don't sell or provide a stabilizing arm brace to any customer, buyer, or transferee in the same transaction. We've gotten this question a lot. That shows intent. Don't do that. Do not ship any FFL to FFL transfer, transfers consisting of an AR pistol and a stabilizing arm brace. Advise all customers to remove their stabilizing arm braces before you accept them for trade, pawn, or purchase. Advise customers they may elect to complete a Form 1 on their own and register the firearm as an NFA or an SBR uh, tax-free until May 31st. So you have this period of time where somehow, some way, uh, the ATF has made a tax exemption status for these Form 1s, which is interesting. Other solutions? Customers in FFLs may remove the short barrel and attach that 16-inch barrel or longer and have, a, you know, a firearm that has a 26-inch or more length, overall length. So that gets you out of it completely. You can keep the arm brace attached as long as it's got that 16-inch barrel and is over 26 inches in overall length. You can certainly, I don't know anybody that's going to do this, but you can certainly surrender them to the ATF uh, or you can destroy them as well. I've only had one person actually call me and ask for the instructions for destruction. So very interesting. Keep things legal. AR pistols, arm braces attached, remain in your possession today. Immediately remove and separate the unapproved arm brace. All right. Arm braces by themselves are, again, not illegal. So if it's just an arm brace in a box, you get a bunch of those SB tactical up on the shelf. You can continue to sell them, but I would certainly provide uh the customer who is making the purchase with the information that hey if you attach this to a gun uh you could be in the in the realm of nfa and you need to make sure you you understand what the requirements are all right if you're not sure stabilizing arm braces designed and installed to facilitate shooting by handicapped persons are still permissible all right so uh you know if the individual is a combat vet or uh, amputee or something like that um you know arm braces are still acceptable for use by you know uh, those that are disabled no action is necessary in this situation uh and if you want especially you as manufacturers uh you want to submit a firearm to FATD uh for evaluation and approval you can certainly do that so 
All right. Firearm examples for ruling 2021 R 05F. Uh, this is an exhaustive list, but this is certainly uh, one that the ATF has provided and uses in some of their slides. So we'll go through these real quick. Believe it or not, this was the one that was originally submitted to FATD for approval. This was the very first one, and this is the method in which it was to be intended to be used. You'll see the Velcro wraps around the entire arm, et cetera. All right, if you look at this one, you can see that they don't show the back of it, but it's got enough surface area. Uh, it's the SB Tactical SBA 3 version. This is no longer acceptable. All right. Uh, they consider that one to, uh, to be able to be shoulder fired. This is that um, tail hook one. I get a lot of questions on this one. Yeah, that doesn't wrap around the entire arm. So that is definitely not acceptable. And they consider that able to be shoulder fired. Not that I would want to do it, but that's okay. Uh, these are those AKVs from Palmetto State. Uh, and that's that weird looking kind of skeletal butt stock. Uh, I, I tried to put that thing around my arm. I could barely get the rubber undone to get it, get it to fit around my arm. So that's a big no, no. Uh, this is the Scorpion EVO. Um, again, that's an accessory on the back of there. So that needs to be removed. It's not a part of the functionality of the firearm. And again, that's similar to the last one we just saw. It's very difficult to wrap that thing around your entire arm. So you need to remove that completely. All right. This is that GLAC, uh, the CAA Micro Roni kit. This is the one where you can slide that uh, Glock right inside there. Uh, this is considered an SBR now. So it in and of itself, if, if there's no firearm inserted into it, it's just an accessory. But as soon as that firearm gets inserted into it, it becomes an SBR. So, so you could sell those separately, just not to the same person at the same time. Would that be the guide on that, John? Exactly. Are buffer tubes legal? Yes, they are. It's, in, it, it's you know, important to the cycle of the operations of the firearm. So yes, buffer tubes are fine. Uh, you want those pistol buffer tubes to be six to six and a half inches. So um you know, it cannot be designed or intended to be fired from the shoulder. So that's, you know, with the uh, buffer tubes, those are not designed or redesigned to be fired from the shoulder. If you do it, please send me a video. I want to see. <laughs> now, they have to be essential, though, to the functionality of the. Yes, it has to be cash. essential. So if it's a pistol tube or something like that, that's attached for aesthetics to like a CZ Scorpion or something. I know there's a couple different firearms out there that they've attached these things. If, if it's just an accessory, then it cannot be attached to the firearm. Right. We're getting a lot of questions about posts or types of similar and maybe non-functional buffer tubes that are part of the molded original design of the firearm. And those two are okay to leave. You don't have to um, destroy the original design of the firearm if it's been approved by the ATF. All right. Uh, ATF, if you go out to their website, they've given you a little reference chart. I know we included a link here, probably can't uh, click on it or anything, but if you go out to the ATF website and just do a search for this reference chart, provide you with some good ideas on, on what can and can't be done, what is acceptable and what isn't. Yeah. If, if we, if we were able to put out a guide, we just say, remove the, remove the, uh, arm brace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, our instructions to everybody thus far has been take the arm brace off. Right. Don't mess around with this. There, there are a ton of lawsuits going on. We fully anticipate, it's pure speculation right now, we fully anticipate an injunction, but we just don't know when. So okay. better to be safe than sorry. Because once an inspector shows up, you can't undo anything. So. All right. Well, that was the two big nuts. I'm glad you attended for those. And again, we'll be providing those in uh, separate trainings out to you guys in recorded format. And then uh, let's go through inspections real quick. Uh, these numbers off to the left show the years. We are currently in fiscal year 2022, according to the ATF. We're four months into it, October, November, December, January. 
already 2,000 inspections. We expect to hit that six, seven, eight thousand mark this year. Uh, we do expect to have very similar to last year, uh, a, a 20 percent increase over prior years. Uh, looking over though, um, look at that number 52. That's how many FFLs have already been revoked, meaning finalized, gone through the six to 12 month process of hearings, informal hearings, final hearings, lawyers, uh, corrective action plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, JC, what do you think this year? 150 maybe? Total? Uh, yeah. Uh, based on the math, we're probably looking at more than 150 actually finalized rev revocations. So again, you'll guys, notice, yeah. you'll notice yeah. you know, you know, historically, they used to do about 40 a year. So, and that was held true for the three years or two or three years prior to 2020. And now, I mean, we saw 125% increase last year. And we're going to see a, a much a steeper climb this year. Yeah. So, yeah. According to Steve Dettelbeck at the AT, at the ATF presentation at Shot Show, they are not letting up on this. They are two, two years ahead, full steam ahead for good reason, according to the ATF. You know, because the rogue gun dealers have to be um, have the licenses revoked. So we still haven't figured out what rogue really means. So we don't want to go down that road. We don't want you calling us and, and saying, I have a hearing in two weeks. We, we, don't, we don't need that. We, <laughs> there's only two of us doing this. And even if we, we're trying to farm out some of these hearings to other folks that just don't have the, um, uh, I want to say, experience, traction, understanding of the process. And it is very, very difficult. So the strategy is to have a successful inspection, right, JC? Yeah, absolutely. So here's what you need to do right now. If you haven't already or you're not already doing it, definitely if ATF IOI shows up at your door, they're, they're most certainly going to do the last 12 months of transaction activity. So the first thing that you need to do right out the gate is you need to review the last 12 months of Form 4473s. Now, if you're already doing this as part of your compliance processes and, and you're staying up on it from a month to month basis, obviously you're fine, but keep it going. But those of you that haven't, you need to go back through your last 12 months and really with a scrutinizing eye, look at every Form 4473 to make sure they're correct. You need to remove any unnecessary, unnecessary supplement documentation. Uh, these are business records and you want to keep those in a buddy file. That's what we call that parallel filing system, buddy file of all your business records and file them in such a way that they're done in, in the same order that your 4473s are. So in the event you have to go back and, and look for something, evidence that you transacted a firearm properly. Boom, you have it. You have it available to you and you can do what is necessary or what's asked of you. There are only five documents, really six, that need to be attached to the 4473. That's that continuation sheet for any time you sell more than three firearms. That's your 3310.4 and or 3310.12 if you're a, a southern border state. Those need to be attached to the corresponding 4473. That AMD ID for overturned uh, NICs or point of contact state uh, uh, denied uh, background checks. That AMD ID letter that the state or federal government issues to that individual has to be attached to the 4473. That non-immigrant alien um, exemption. That's that hunting license. I seriously doubt anybody has ever seen one of those other exemptions fulfilled. So you need to show evidence that they were permitted because they had that copy of that uh, of that fishing or hunting license, rather. So you need that attached. All right. Uh, you need that perjury statement in the event you're selling a firearm to somebody uh, who's purchasing it on behalf of an organization, association, or business. Uh, and then lastly, uh, it'll be that correction. If you do an error correction after the fact, after the firearm has been transferred, you need to print out, you need to make a photocopy of the page with an error, make the corrections to that photocopy and attach that to the 4473 as well. Keep in mind that you can still be cited for that violation. So just be aware of that. But you know what? It's better to get it fixed and show you're proactive about that than not to fix it and let it go by the wayside. Prevent NICs and point of contact state violations. Oh my God. This is the vast majority of revocations that we're dealing with. Uh, either not doing a NICS check or letting a NICS check expire or not waiting the three-day wait, et cetera. So here's what I want you to do. Every day, I want you to print off your, uh, your history for that day. 
at the end of day. All right, make that a part of your daily close of operations routine. I want you to print off every print detail for every NICS or point of contact state uh, control number that you receive. You guys should be transitioning over to electronic. It'll make your life so much easier. Um, for those point of contact states where you get a summary report or a bill, make sure you're keeping that document. It's vitally, vitally important. I've had three FFLs now that were able to produce that document, and we were able to utilize that in the defense of their, revo the, their notice of revocation. Um, print and download uh, or download your search history query on a monthly basis. That means the first of every month or the 30th, 31st of every month, print off the prior month's activity on NICS or your point of contact state and keep that on file. And then lastly, this is going to help you tremendously notate that NICS or point of contact state 30-day expiration date in Block 32. The reason we're telling people to do this is when the customer returns and recertifies that form, you as the seller of the firearm or one of your employees can immediately look to see what the expiration date was for that background check and ensure that you do not transfer the firearm after that 30 day wait. And yeah, the whole, and the, yeah. and the uh, yeah. other piece to this is for waiting periods. If you live in a jurisdiction where there's a waiting period, go ahead and put the waiting period date in block 32 too. So you can make sure that you do not transfer that firearm prior to the wait date, uh, waiting period expiration. Yeah. Or Jesse, you going to yeah, yeah, the, the the 32, this new one is a new one for us. We started doing it for uh, with some customers with this uh five, you know, we were in Florida last week, full disclosure. And um, you know, first of all, JC said print that monthly bill. You have the monthly bill, cross-reference that to all of your 4473s. Mm -hmm. And that's a great, great reference if you if you're missing a NICS number or have a partial NICS number. Uh, you know, it's great. But back to 32 with the date, you're seeing right there, 31 is the is the transfer date. For the uh, uh, you know the um, recertification, and when you have that date in 32, you can't miss it. You can't make that mistake. Uh, versus turning the page and looking back to what my NICS may have said I should do. So it's a great little technique. Uh, we actually saw someone else using it, and it's a fabulous thing to copy. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Utilize your your uh, monthly download to account for all your 4473s. You can obviously do this more frequently, but you know 30 days. It's a good way to you know, here's how many NTNs I was issued. Here's how many control numbers I was issued. I have the same amount of 4473s. You can also take it one step further and actually audit uh, control numbers and the NTN numbers to make sure everything matches. I can tell you, we see a lot of instances where somebody transposes characters, uh, letters and numbers uh, in an NTN or in a control number, or they leave a digit off. So you want to be able to account for that. Um, lastly, on the 4473, we see this quite a bit, phone numbers, email addresses being written block 32. Um, we're recommend stop doing this. Keep, keep account of the customer contact information in another place. Either create a customer form, look at your point of sale, see if that has an option. Uh, utilize something else to collect this information because remember, if it's on the form, we've actually had IOIs call customers and ask about uh, transactions. So. <laughs> But, but here's one thing that the ATF has never listed a customer uh, number information block on there for, for legal reasons. But last week, we, we needed to contact two customers and we couldn't find them. And guess what? That the, that client right now is holding two um, invalid transfers yep. in their file. And we, we just hope they don't get inspected for the next 12 months because there's no way to contact these customers to track them down because they've moved. We tried everything. We tried certified letters, et cetera. Have this phone number, or email address, someplace in your business records. It's critical. Okay. All right. Obviously, we're here to help. Um, we've got that restricted states quick reference guide for you all. Uh, just reach out. We're happy to send that to you. Uh, there's just a lot of nuances out there with everything going on. Illinois, Oregon, even Florida. Um, Florida is a very gun-friendly state, but you as an FFL, if you're selling to an out-of-state resident, you need to be aware that they have a waiting period. You're required to actually abide by that waiting period, even though you're not in Florida. So uh, it just gives you a heads up of all the different nuances related to states that have pretty restrictive measures in place that you need to be careful of, because guess what? Notices of revocation are being issued 
for FFLs that don't comply with the laws of both states. Get that overlay guide from the NSSF for those of you that are members. And if you're not members, you definitely need to look into that and support that trade association that supports you. But the NSSF, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, if you don't know who they are, you definitely know who SHOT Show is. Uh, they are the parent organization of SHOT Show. Get that overlay guide from them. All right. It, it's, it's very useful. I would wait until the new form is actually out and the new overlay guide is provided. Uh, you can certainly go out and get them now, but um, there will be a new overlay guide issued. Get our ATF pre-inspection guide. Uh, that's vitally important to help you succeed uh, before the ATF gets to your door, all right? That, that, it's very rare that they're gonna call ahead of time to let you know they're coming. And if they do, it's going to be in very close proximity to the date they show up. Atypically, it's the day before, if they call at all. The bottom line is, if you are open for business, you are able to be inspected. Doesn't matter if you as a responsible person are on site or not. You, you are open for business, you're being inspected. Uh, we've talked about this a bunch, that ATF law enforcement communications log. Keep that. You know, Anytime you help the ATF, anytime you help local law enforcement, anytime you go to training, ongoing training, shows that you are not plainly indifferent, that you are not willful, that you take things seriously. But all of this in conjunction with one another helps me or helps JB when we're defending you in the uh, matter of a revocation, because I don't need you scrambling to figure out when you went to a seminar or when you helped the ATF or when you helped law enforcement. Keep all this together. Keep this information together in a little journal or communications log, so that way it'll help you down the road. I know it's tedious, it's time consuming, but it'll help you, trust me. And then obviously, um, mock ATF audits. Uh, we have an entire team of people that can help you with mock audits to make sure that you're you're good, you know, that you're solid before the ATF shows up. That's key. You do not want the ATF showing up and you look at them like a deer in the headlights. Yep. Hey, for the sake of time, guys, uh, it's 12, 12.06 where we are. Um, we're gonna do, we have five more minutes of presentation. Then we're going to jump into FAQ. If you've got to run, this entire recording will be sent to you. The link will, if you registered for today, thank you for joining. Or if you join late, the entire session will be sent to you in a link next week. We're, we're out. We were both on airplanes tonight and just can't get it done before next week. So this will be sent to you. Just FYI. Stay tuned. Um, just get it right the first time. This is our mantra for you know we don't want to do a hearing we want you to have a be inspection ready every day so again uh if you've had inspections before in the past make sure you look at those notes those if you had just notes or revocations you cannot have repeat violations if you had any adverse action in the past such as a warning or revocation and you worked your way back to um being in good graces with the atf you cannot have any violations we don't care if it's 10 years ago or 15 years ago, the ATF can reference back to those records and cause you to be revoked. Review every ATF uh, 4473 twice before the transfer and the third time before you file it. That's gotta be your rule in house. Uh, conduct your quarterly inventories, do your A&D entries daily. If you're not electronic, just do them daily. Make that a, a nightly or morning practice. Prevent straw purchases, complete your multiple handgun and long gun forms and respond to those traces within 24 hours and keep proof. All right. As you know, we, uh, JC, I love this slide you've made up. You know, we went together, you talked to us, we talked to you, we all talked to each other, we share information and we beat a revocation. So keep the information coming, call with questions, share the good news and share the best practices. If you haven't been to our website recently, our inspection guide is still there. Or if you're new on our call, Go to our website, fflconsultants.com, download your free guide. It's six pages, chock full of great preparation information for you to prepare for your inspection if you've never been inspected and to give you all the tidbits and nuances of what they're looking for today regarding the Biden Zero Tolerance Program. This guide has helped, absolutely helped everyone get through their inspections. People call and thank us. And then unfortunately, other people call and say, the F ATF is here, what do I do? And we find out they never they never prepped. They didn't read the guide and they have to scramble to try to fix things before the ATF discovers their errors. Please go download that today at our website. Uh, coming to a city near you, here's where we're traveling through the spring. 
many different cities. Obviously, we're all across the country. This doesn't even list all of them. But we want you to watch your for Nick's retailer days. The uh, we're teaming up with Nick's again, FBI Nick's and the ATF, and we will be out. I think 15 or 16 locations through March, April, and May and June. So you can go to our website, fflconsultants.com. There's a, at the bottom, you'll see, click here to see the schedule. Um, so the schedule is available on our website, uh, but the invite and the specific location and time will come from Nix directly. They're still finalizing some locations and event times, whether it be 8 a.m. or noon or something like that. It's great. We're there. They're there. We're answering all your questions. Bring your people, send your people, but make sure you watch for those invites. And as we hear those invites going out, we will remind you to check your email to look for them. Uh, JC, you're going to be at the Sports Inc. session in a couple of weeks? I will be at the Sports Inc. session. I believe that's the 23rd through 27th or something like that of February. So not this upcoming week, but the week after. All right. So um, hopefully JC will be doing some similar present <clears throat> presentation. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then we'll be at the uh, tech, either JC or myself or both of us will be at the Texas Pawn Association session, the Pacific Northwest Pawn Association and the National Pawn Association uh, sessions, uh, either in the booth for the NSSF, answering your questions or doing presentations on these very critical topics. So we hope to see you in the future. Uh, if you're not an NSSF member, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, we had three people call us in the last month crying because they didn't join and they're getting inspected or got a, a notice of revocation and don't have the legal defense fund in, 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 in check or in place and don't have the money to defend against the all the legality proceedings you have to pay for or even us to help you get through it. So uh, if you're not an NSSF member yet, um, there's a premium retail program out there. We can talk to you more about it offline. Just give us a call to get you signed up. It is $750 a year, but a small price as compared to the ten dollars or $15,000 legal bill you'll have if you get a revocation resulting from an inspection. Uh, there's also a $100 membership for members that you know have less benefits. But again, if you're a member, thank you. If you want to upgrade, let us know. Uh, we are independent consultants for the National Shooting Sports Foundation supporting you and you your success and jc that's it we're ready for questions all right lightning round let's do it all right guys um well i mean while well, we i guess i'll read <laughs> i'll read them off and uh we'll, we'll take them in order as they come uh residence go. oh reside in city limits seems to draw questions from my customers uh, did i not go over there i didn't uh, that. no you didn't you oh did not. okay real quick guys and thank you for bringing that up how did I miss that? Um, here's what happens when NICS, the NICS, NICS Denial Act now re requires that ATF NICS notify local law enforcement of someone who's denied and they have to, and, and they have, for if, if it qualifies under certain conditions, meaning felony, meaning um, Warren's supposed to apply for a firearm transfer, Warren's supposed to try to buy a gun. There are some critical issues in the, in the background here whereby NICS has to notify law, local law enforcement of a denied firearms uh, background check. And they have, to they have to notify them within 24 hours by law, they have to do that. And the only way for them to, to, to communicate to the appropriate law enforcement agency is knowing if they're within a city or maybe the county uh, jurisdiction. So that's why residing in city limits, for example, Birmingham, Alabama, if somebody lives in Birmingham proper, they're gonna get the city of Birmingham notification to the police department. If they live outside of Birmingham, Alabama, but within the uh, un unincorporated area of Birmingham, it's probably going to go to a county sheriff notification. That is the simple reason why that question is now on the 4473. And thank you, um, uh, uh, Tom, for bringing that up. But that is why, and people, most people are not going to know, just commonly, they may not know if they're, they live within the city limits or unincorporated part of the city. If they don't know, they simply list N.A., but by checking yes or no, they will better further the uh, requirement of ATF NICS or actually FBI NICS to make that notification as they have to. All right, great question. Uh, JC has one for you regarding SBRs. Can you give clarity as to whether Illinois residents are allowed to apply for a form one or will they be automatically denied? I'll give you that answer, yeah. automatically denied. <laughs> automatically denied, yeah. 
Yeah. Until but, until the things going on in Illinois get an injunction, which there's an injunction, but you have to be enjoined in yeah. that in that legal battle. So it doesn't apply to you. So the extension on that is any state that doesn't allow for SBRs already right. by yeah. law to stipulate uh, you will not be able to use this process to obviously try to get an SBR. Exactly. Uh, they are shipping this. OK. They are shipping this exact form now, no others. Yes, they, this is the form that the 4473 is getting shipped. But again, it is subject to change. So don't be surprised. You know the government if they change something or a question or part of the instructions. But move forward otherwise. Uh, on private party transfers, does how does that relate when an individual sells a used firearm on gun broker or similar, or even a retailer selling used firearm? Great question. So a private party transfer is not when someone sells through you uh, using the internet or any internet platform or comes, comes in to consign a firearm, maybe. A, a private party transfer is strictly when two people who know each other in, in some, some way, they could be friends, neighbors, online connections. Two people walk in, they approach you at, a, at the counter. One wants to transfer a gun to the other person, and they simply want to use you for the purpose of documenting the transfer and completing the background check, period. Don't overcomplicate anything happening online. An FFL transfer is an FF, that, that person selling a gun on gun broker is shipping to you or having somebody ship to you as an FFL to FFL transfer. That is totally different than a private party transfer. Yep. Okay. Anything to add on that one, JC? No. Nope. Okay. Um, eight. Pawn, uh, something AT, oh, ATF pawn redemptions, private, or, oh, are pawn redemptions, private party transfers? That's definitely no. no. As a, as a pawn, when you pawn, when someone pawns a gun, you take, you take custodial possession of that firearm temporarily. You, it may get relinquished to you through a fault of the, of the loan. But in the meantime, you are the firearms dealer holding that gun. <clears throat> and when you return it, you are returning it to somebody new, basically. They own it, but you are committing that uh, just like a new, new or used gun transfer. All right. Most customers do not understand this question and it's causing a problem. I guess that's the one we just mentioned. If I understand 21B, which is one of the new questions, it can't be answered until 21C through M are answered or at least read. Doesn't that make sense to ask a question refers to a lot of following questions? I applaud you, Marcia. Marcia, Marcia. <laughs> Um, the answer is technically, now that you pose it, the answer would be yes, but yes, the, that customer would have to view yeah. and review those questions before answering 21B and or 21C. They provide reference to it. So basically their intent is to have the transfer buyer go through and review the other questions. Um, I, I honestly hope, I doubt it, but I hope that'll cause transfer buyers, your customers, to actually read through <laughs> all of the questions because that's the biggest issue that we have when we do mock inspections. Yeah. Yeah. People just, they check things before they read them. We know that happens. Yeah. But shame on them. All right. JC, what about fundraising events that club schools, nonprofit organizations wanting to buy guns to raise money? Could us, meaning a store, be involved in straw mans since they are not long-term owners, even if return to go to 4473 at the store. Um, here's what I would tell you with that. We just had one of these uh, last week. Um, I think it was Ducks Unlimited, but the way the FFL is doing it, um, it's for an event. They're not. They're notating that in Block 32. A couple different things. Obviously, if you're going to these events, you as the FFL or a W-2 employee can certainly take those firearms to the event for display. And then that firearm would need to be returned to your premise, to your storefront, to have the transaction completed, all right? Now, there are other scenarios where if, in fact, like Ducks Unlimited is coming in and, and you want to transfer the firearms to an officer of their organization, it has to be an officer of the organization that's permitted to act on behalf of the organization. You can certainly transfer that firearm to them via 4473, do a background check unless uh, they satisfy an exemption like having a CWP and that's allowed in your state. Um, and then have them do a perjury statement that basically states they are purchasing this firearm for Ducks Unlimited, for whomsoever. 
uh, for that organization they're representing. Uh, and then, you know, transfer the firearm and then bring it back in to your business from them once they're ready to transfer it to another person. Uh, you just need to make the notation that, hey, this was being uh, transferred to this individual for use for display at an event. Uh, and they brought it back. And now we're selling it to the person that won it, that, you know, won the raffle, whatever the case may be. It's a pretty long, drawn out process. Uh, it is the way that one of our clients wanted to do it. So we figured out the best uh, strategy and course of action for them to take. So, um, but no, that wouldn't be considered a straw purchase. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, on the 30 day issue, does that count or not count weekends, holidays, et cetera, working days or calendar days? It's 30 calendar days. 30 calendar days. And again, that's on the uh, expiration of that uh, background check being submitted. It starts counting the day after you submit it. Yep. Right. Day one is the day after you, you initiated the background check. Yep. Uh, Tony, thank you for Tombstone Tactical, one of our great callers. Uh, he says, not getting phone calls anymore from Nix on this extended notification of the 10-day delay. All notifications to us has been through the Nix site. So well, that's good yeah. because they've had the problems with that and they have been calling. I still have FFLs that are telling me they're calling them. So yeah, um, the uh, Nix team is stressed, obviously, because of many things happening. Um, so check your Nix e-site and in, in doubt, don't make a mistake. You know, call if you have to and verify if you're still using telephone. ATF status screen currently shows normal Brady dates. Oh, yeah, it does not ref not reflect the additional days for under 21. Spoke to them about this, and they are aware of a no time frame for a fix. Yeah, not, not surprised. Yeah. Um, here, here's the bottom line with the under 21 thing, the 18 to 20 year olds. We're, we're giving everybody the advice, just wait the 10 days. I, I don't care what Nick tells you. I don't care what anybody tells you. Just wait the 10 days. That'll keep you safe sound we've had too many instances where you know they wait until the third day they don't hear anything back and then they release the firearm and then on day five somebody calls them and says hey hold that firearm uh we're just telling everybody wait the yeah. 10 days and, and remember as an ffl one you ref, you, could, you have a reserve the right to refuse to transfer to anyone for whatever reason whatsoever okay remember that but number two you can have stricter rules than your state or federal government require uh, we have FFLs who are making this 10-day thing mandatory 10 days, like JC just explained. Other ones are not not ever releasing on a, on a delay to anyone right. under 21 unless they get a proceed. Yep. So you can have internal controls stricter than what's required, and that is perfectly okay. Yep. We just suggest what you do for one, do for everyone. Exactly. So you don't run into any discrimination issues. Yep. Right. Um, if an FFL is going to be inspected, what type of notice is given or do they just show up? Again, very rare that they're going to call you ahead of time. That's typically for those home-based or, or very out there, out in the rural area somewhere where it would take hours for them to get out there. Uh, but generally speaking, they just show up. They, they'll probably be at the door uh, when you open. See you on Friday. Uh, we got somebody talking here. Uh, okay. When your doors open or they'll show up shortly after you open. Uh, we had an FFL that we were visiting uh, in Oklahoma and they showed up about, uh, oh, I don't know, like an hour after we showed up at the store. So um, very interesting there. Yeah. Any idea when online 4473 will be available? Uh, the online 4473 is available uh, right now. Uh, you can download and print that at will. Uh, the forms, if you're one of those FFLs that orders the forms through the ATF Distribution Center, those were available 12 days ago on February 1st. Uh, solution providers are working diligently to get their solution systems updated with the new e-form and the requirements. Again, it is not mandatory until April 1. Yeah, and John, this might be um, referencing uh, ATF E4473, I imagine... If that's what this is re a reference to, they're not going to publish it until it's finalized. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, what about the city limits question? We just went over that. Uh, hopefully yeah. that we explain that. I have a customer who is wondering if they could register their AR lower through a Form 1 and get the tax stamp covered with the intent of making a rifle into an SBR no. in the future. No, it must have been an AR pistol with the pistol brace attached uh, into the what they're classifying as the SBR uh, at the time uh, that the law went into effect or ruling went into effect. Yeah, so catching no up with an hour. 
or, or, or cheating is uh, certainly they'll be watching for. And, yeah. and believe me, um, in some discussions I've had, they can go back and ask for receipts for stabilizing arm braces and different things. It's it's kind of going to get wacky, but expect the worst as we're telling everyone on this whole process. Uh, and then there's, and then this fallout. I mean, they're saying this is okay for four months, and everyone's worried about what happens later. Okay. Um, I guarantee there are videos of people shouldering firearms and only a buffer tube. <laughs> now, I don't have time looking for them. So if you find one, you let me know. <laughs> yeah. Does it affect? Well, we've been told many, many, many times by ATF folks directly, even Steve Duddleback announced, if it has a buffer tube, it is not going to be illegal, quote unquote. Again, they say it has to be essential to the functionality of the firearm, has to have a spring in it, et cetera. But um, just, just stick with that for now. Uh, buffer tubes are not going to make people into felons. Uh, does it affect the Comrade shotgun? No, it does not affect smoothbore firearms. Rifle barrels only. Yep. Because essentially that this whole law is written around an AR pistol with an arm brace turning into a short barrel rifle. Rifle is the key word there. Uh, can a customer have a suppressor welded on a pistol barrel to meet the 16 inch barrel requirement? Yes. Uh, pinned and welded, yes. Uh, yeah. But keep in mind, you still have to have that 26-inch overall length. Yeah. Uh, unless unless it's, uh, unless it's yeah, I mean, yeah, then it turns into an, another NFA registration for right. an SBR. Yeah. I understand I can sell the braces as accessories, as the ATF does not deal with accessories. They just can't sell it in the same transaction with the rifle. But actually, pistol would be the word, right? Right. Yes, the answer is yes. You cannot sell it together to the same customer and allegedly not have knowledge that you're selling it to the same customer because that's something called what? Constructive possession? Possession, yes. Yeah. So if a customer buys an arm brace today and comes back to your store in a week and buys an AR pistol and there's no memory of that person, who knows? But again, we don't know what the fallout of this thing is going to be afterwards. Correct. Um, has the ATF waived the $200 tax stamp for the SBRs registered during this 120-day period? Only for this scenario. Yes. Only if you, and, and, the, and the Form 1 has been updated and, and has a new box you have to check attesting to the fact that you were in possession of the arm brace and the AR pistol prior to the implementation of the law. Yep. So again, if you're lying on a form, that's, that's a no-no. Uh, what if you can't get the pawn customer to take off the brace? Make every effort to contact them, but if you can't reach them for whatever reason, they've fallen off the face of the earth, just go ahead and take it take it off. But um, you know, definitely keep record of your attempts to contact them. Yep. And I, I we had a call this morning on this, and the bottom line was is the, the ATF, the FFL rather, has made numerous attempts, has called the contact and contacted customer. Customer keeps promising to come in. And I said, well, your next call simply is if they're not in by Friday, by law, you have to surrender it to the ATF. And I bet they'll be there by Thursday. So make it hard, you know, make it, make it hurt. These customers can be jeopardizing your position as an FFL. Um, there's an ATF chart showing dealers, manufacturers have the same 120 days. FFLs and uh, non-licensed individuals all fall into that amnesty period. Um, you know, uh, it's 120 days from the date it was um, uploaded to the Federal Register. Right. And, and the clarification is this. You have 120 days to register them, yep. but you cannot walk around with them. Well, as an FFL, you can't have them attached for 100 days, no. this, this, this the, amnesty period. The only, the only way you can have them attached in your store on display is if you've already submitted your Form 1 and you maintain proof of that. Then you can do that. That's fine. It's the same with civilians or non-licensees. As long as you've submitted that Form 1 for that firearm, you can still be in possession of it in that configuration and use it. No difference. Um, on one of our inspections last week, it was a pawnbroker, and the ATF went through and opened every case, obviously did their inventory, and found five AR pistols with arm braces attached. And uh, again, last week, you know, they said, take these off immediately, you know, like immediately. And they had to scurry to do so, but we can't guarantee that leniency in your pawnbroker storage area if you have guns in pawn and you haven't opened gun cases and looked in gun cases. So heads up on this. Uh, we can't help you if you call us and this is the issue. Uh, JC, um, this is the uh, chart showing 
you know, it's the same chart we had in our slideshow. Sure. Yep. But again, the 120 days is for the filing, uh, not for the constructive uh, possession. You can't have those connected today without a form one being submitted. That's exactly. illegal. Yep. Uh, can I rent the brace? Can I rent a brace in my indoor range? It's a brace, I guess, connected. If you to have an right? approved form one or you submitted your form one, you can so totally rent a firearm with a brace. Yeah. If you're just renting a brace by itself, I don't know what you're renting that for. But if somebody attaches it to a firearm, there's going to be a problem. So, yeah. Um, but if you have an if you have an AR pistol with a brace on it and you've submitted your form one, yes, you can still rent that firearm. And and folks, we'll be we'll be coming back to this top this this whole SBR topic in months ahead, March, April, May, as we get through this with more questions and explanations. But uh, this whole thing is just very muddy. As we explain, yeah. as we say, it's very muddy. Um, so can I? Uh, so when the one-armed guy brings in the AR pistol for gunsmithing, how do I handle that? Yeah. So you really need to take a look at the firearm and make the determination of whether or not it could be shoulder fired. The the key is: does that arm brace act as support for him to operate the firearm? Velcro wraps all the way around, or arm brace wraps all the way around the forearm. Uh, it doesn't have an extended length of pull, et cetera. So you really need to take a look at that. But generally speaking, as long as it fits all the requirements and he is truly a handicapped or disabled individual, then you shouldn't have any issue. Let me let me further state that as a gunsmith, a type one, type two, or any gunsmith, you're allowed to work on NFA firearms without an SOT. That is correct. So it's not as critical for this, uh, Greg, you asked this question. It's not as critical for a gunsmith to worry about it. As long as you're returning that firearm back to the person you received it from. And, you know, do you have conversation about whether or not it's registered? You might, but you don't have to. And you don't have to register it and you don't just make sure it's segregated, identified and labeled as a gunsmith firearm, you know, service firearm. Um, he says uh, that is not what the ATF stated, but that's the, that's the rule. If a person is disabled, what do we need to provide to ATF? Nothing, right? Um, Again, I think this is uh, say, uh, talking about the gunsmithing scenario. Um, if a person is disabled and they bring in a gun for gunsmithing, it's an NFA firearm being worked by uh, a gunsmith without an SOT, which is fine. But if you're a pawnbroker bringing in a gun that has an arm brace on it and you want to maybe purchase it, you definitely have to figure out, well, one, again, take the arm brace off. Uh, for any anyone else looking down the road to purchase uh, an AR, AR pistol, a sharp arrow rifle with a with an arm brace or a stock on it. I mean, you have to do so if you have an SOT, but otherwise you can't. You can't bring that firearm into your possession. And uh, yeah, yeah, you certainly have to ask these people if they've registered the firearm if you're taking it off their hands for any reason uh, for purchase and acquisition. Uh, you don't want to bring in an SBR if you're not an NFA dealer. Hopefully that answers that. Uh, and, and, and you know, uh, so we had a question yesterday, you know, somebody brought in a gun. Am I even, can I even touch it? Well, you can tell, ask the customer to take the arm brace off and then, yeah, you can buy that AR pistol or, or pawn it if you want to, but just have the customer take the arm brace off. All right. Come back tomorrow without an arm brace. Smith and Wesson M&P 1522 brace pistol. We've seen a lot of these. They are not making a barrel to go on them. What is recommendation for this? I believe that firearm is, um, I, why, uh, you know, I don't have, I can't pull it up, JC, but I believe the overall length was 26 uh, inches or longer. It's a pistol grip uh, firearm with, um, I believe, an attached uh, design brace attached, but I'm not sure what the barrel length is. But uh, Denise we'll, uh, or, or Donna, we'll get back to you on that. Make sure you just send me that question and we'll, uh, we'll get a verification on that for you. Uh, for an AR, we know that the tube itself is legal, but the ATF example shows a pistol tube with no spine. Doesn't matter if it has mil spec tube or special tube that comes with Gearhead Works mod to brace. And I guess you can include in that, John, the uh, notches for um, right. the retractable yeah. or adjustable uh, arm braces that we've seen. What the ruling says the ruling says is that you know you have to make it so it can't be reattached. So I know that there are, uh, we're advising everybody to take it off and not worry about it, but there are a few people out there that are making what they call plugs for the notches or the uh, pinpoints on those tubes where the, 
you know, the adjust for the adjustable arm braces. Um, you can certainly, and we've had a number of FFLs who have called us to let us know what they're doing. Um, you can certainly buy those plugs and insert them, glue them in. Uh, so that way those notches and, and nothing can be reattached. John, this is specific to the buffet tube, not the um, opening. Uh, so the, yeah, the answer is, yeah, the answer is bus, buffet tubes, as long as they're part of the firearm required for uh, functionality of the um, ret retracting recoil, bolt retraction, et cetera, um, gas suppression, you can have those attached even if they have notches in them, even if they have a spine on them that housed a brace yeah. prior. Right. I, I, again, it's not the it's not the buffer tube that is illegal. It's the brace for shouldering sur, uh, for surface area, allowing for shouldering that firearm right. as an SBR. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, will it be to say? Will it be an issue if a customer trades or sells a pistol that could have a brace attached, but is currently in pistol form that was registered as an SBR? And as a dealer, do we have any way to know it was registered? No, as a dealer, you have no way to know it's registered other than ask the customer. Um, so if they tell you it's registered in SBR, uh, anybody with a, look, you're not required by regulation or law to notify the ATF NFA division that you've changed the configuration of a registered firearm. It's recommended that if you change an SBR back to a pistol, that you remove it from the registry. But if you want to make it back to an SBR again, then you leave it in the registry. So, um, but the only way you're going to find out if, if a firearm is registered is if you ask the customer. Yeah. And again, the ATF had a lot of training on this. They have documentation as we do. Uh, you are not required to call NFA ATF and say, oh, I have an AR pistol. Can you tell me if it was ever registered as an SBR? Because it doesn't have, it's not an SBR when it's, when it's pre presented to you you acquire that firearm in its current state of, of construct, of design. And um, if it's a pistol, it's a pistol. You know, whether or not it was registered prior, let them figure it out. You know, if it ever gets traced, let the ATF figure that out. But you are not required to make that verification. Can a smooth bore, such as a TAC-14 or Mossberg shockwave, keep a pistol brace if it has been installed? The, the answer to that is yes. It doesn't have anything to do with smooth bore barrels. Right. And the That's other, the other issue on this style firearm. So yeah, the other issue is those those other firearms, those shotguns that are 26 and a half inches overall to begin with. Yep. And they have a, you know, with their um, you know, now if they've had their this original design pistol grip or a bird's head handle removed, and you now have an arm brace on there, and without the arm braces less than 26 inches, you have a problem anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's a short barrel shotgun. Right. Or I'm sorry, that's on any other weapon. So you, if you guys got these the shotgun questions, just send us texts or questions and we'll figure those out. But um for the most part, Chuck, the 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 any other weapon, or I'm sorry, the other the firearm with a smooth bore has to be 26 inches or longer. Have you all published the list of items to include with each 4473 that I'm able to print off to include in our SOP? Chris, and I'll get <laughs> the answer is not yet, but I took copious notes while JC went over that area, and we will have that. Uh, we'll send that out to you, which is a great, great training point. We'll send that out to you. Uh, I actually have a JB, and I'll send it to you. I just sent it to one of the uh, distributors. Great. Yeah, Chris, Kristen was asking for that. Yeah. Um, so when when you point uh, when the point of contact of state takes more than thirty days, how do you handle that, JC? We initiate a background check. You can use the same forty four seventy three if you'd like and document the fact that you reinitiated a background check, or you can start a whole new forty four seventy three. But yes, there are some states that go well over thirty days. Um, so you know, thirty days is thirty days. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So so his we did this in Florida last week again. Thank you, my clients in Florida. We had fun. Uh, but long story short is take that 4473. You do not need to have the customer recertify box 21 uh, or 23 rather. But if you're re if you're re resubmitting that through, will it be uh, your state agency or next, you have to put a second date in box 27A. And then you'll have, obviously, you'll probably get a second NOC, um, uh, NTN status number or submittal number. You'll put that in box 27B, you know, and you'll get 
you know, new results and you know, make your little script notes in uh, box 32, resubmit it after 30 day expiration, resubmit it to Nix or resubmit it to New York or Florida or wherever you are, where you have Illinois. We have a lot of dealers, FFLs that just start a new 4473. Yeah. Too. Whatever yeah. you find easier. Yep. It's up to you. No matter what though, you have to keep that first form because you had that uh, yep. background check control number on it. And you put that in your cancel or dealer delay file, dealer cancel file. Uh, and, and on those, we also make big notes in box 32, gun not transferred. Make sure it's signed, but not dated. Don't date box 36. All right. Um, the next printout of the NTN has an expiration date and time. Is it okay to use that for the expiration 30 day date and time? Absolutely. Yeah, that's the, we had them put that on. Yep. That's, yeah, we did that, what, two years ago, John? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's great. As long that's why JC goes over all those different NICs or and uh, reports and pages you should be printing and filing uh, in your buddy file or elsewhere. It is critical to prove you did the right thing and you, you completed a background check properly. Pennsylvania PICS doesn't allow for printing each us uh, uh, search history query, not search history query. How would we print queries? They have uh, a different. I would have to. Does PICS actually give you any type of? Yeah, Summer. yeah, they have a they have a they have a response notification update little little blurb they give you. Yeah. It's not fully. It doesn't list everything on there, but it does list um, the immediate response. Yeah. So Do they get no any matter type of summary report at the end of the month. There is. There's a bill. Absolutely. Yeah. There you go. Use your yeah. bill. That's what yeah. we do in Florida. They use their bill. Yep. Yeah. Match them all up. But if you have anything that that publishes at the time you submit a background check with any state agency, print it out. Proof that you submitted it, you got the control number, and you got the initial response. Okay. Uh, but the bill, yeah, those bills are great. I love them. Reconcile. All right. Uh, Terry, question regarding NFA 4473. Should we attach the approved form four to the 4473? And if the ATA, if the NFA item was purchased under a truck, well, let's go up the, handle that first one, Joe. You want to take the ones? All right. So here we go. So no, uh, ATF Form 4 is not required to be attached to the associated Form 4473. Our recommendation is that you maintain a copy of the Form 4 separately. And the reason for this is just customer service. People lose their Form 4s all the time. And it's a real pain in the butt for them to get it from the NFA division. So it's a nice little customer service aid for you to provide the customer in the event that they lose their original. All right. Our next question is, if the NFA item was purchased under a trust, do we need the customer to sign a statement that they are representing the trust? No. The perjury statement is no longer required for trusts. The individual just must be issued as a responsible person on the Form 4. Yeah. She, uh, ter uh, Terry says, we are verifying transferee name yep. to Block 22 of the Form 4. That's your responsible persons. Yes. Correct. That's exactly okay. what you're supposed to do. The person yep. picking it up must be listed as a responsible person. Yeah. And, and Terry, like I said in the beginning, if you dial our main number and just pr press the right option, I think it's four for NFA questions, you'll go right to JC, who is our NFA expert. All right. Uh, any any date for new E4473? I think we just said that's probably um, probably going to see it in March. They have to lead to the end of this month to verify the current format for the 4473 and finalize it. Has the ATF started printing the youth handgun safety form? I, I want to say the pamphlet. Yeah, the pamphlet. Um, I know there was an issue with that. Uh, go out to the ATF distribu distribution website and see if you can order them. I'm not sure. I haven't talked to anybody over there in a while. Has there been a revision to it, John? No. All right, so, not so unless my they answer change is, the design or something. Yeah. So my answer is yes. Um, you know, we've been ordering those all, all year. So I just not, ordered 5,000 not that long ago. Yeah. So. So just go to the distribution center, ATF distribution center website. Yeah. All right. Um, if a customer wants to find out if they will pass a background check, where do we send them to find out if they are able to purchase a firearm? Yeah, local law enforcement that is your best place. Do not do background checks for individuals. Seeing if they want to do a, a pass a background check, that is not allowed. That is misuse of the system. It can actually get you suspended or... Uh, kicked off enix completely or your point of contact state so yep. um tell them to go to their local police department and see if they have a, anything disqualifying them or they can go online there's pl plenty of background check systems out there 
Yep. Uh, this that is they a great can order their own background check. Yeah, the quick answer to this, uh, many of you, um, you know, we had this last week with uh, uh, employees of a firearms dealer as well. Everybody, anybody can go to the local courthouse and go to the court clerk and ask for a background check on themselves. All they do is present a driver's license and proof of, of ID. And for this one was four bucks. It would cost four dollars for them to run their background check for their employee, do a printout, hand it to them, and the employee brought it back to the employer and show they had a clean record and hence were hired. Uh, but anybody doing this, uh, refer them to the local courthouse uh, and they, for a, mon a very minor fee, they can get their criminal record verification. See, uh, every truck driver has to do it annually annually for the CDL, the commercial driver's license submittal, renewal every year, and that's how they do it. Um, or go online, like Jay said, JC said, you might find a service that can help. Just on that on that note, uh, the ATF is also coming out with a background check program for yeah. firearm handlers, but that's not going to be out till the end of the spring. We, I'm sorry, Nix will be handling this. Just heads up on that for your employees. It's going to be free of charge. Um, it's going to be available on all Nix first in FBI Nix states, and then hopefully roll out to the point of contact states. So again, that's one of the updates that is not yet ready, nor is the um, used gun. Uh, NCIC check available for used gun purchases. That's going to be the, uh, hopefully six months or so, maybe mid-summer, just FYI on that. Uh, if Illinois allows SBRs, as long as the applicant has a CNR. Oh, yeah. Uh, CNR. You are correct. And the, yes, that is a just a really wonky law in Illinois. I had to deal with this like a month ago. You are correct. And uh, yes, a bunch of people have gone out and gotten their CNR licenses. I have to imagine that sooner or later, Illinois is going to get wind of this and put the kibosh on it. But until then, hey, get your CNR license. You can go buy yourself an SBR in the state of Illinois. Yeah, It's really wonky. Yep, yep. Next, are you allowed to actually tell the customer not to answer 21N and 21N1 and 2? Is that coaching? Uh, I would something? tell you this. You know, we advise everybody the same on this is, you know, tell your customers, make sure they read everything very carefully. In this situation, you can say, and please, if you're a United States citizen, uh, ensure you pay attention to 21N1 and 21N2 as uh, a U.S. citizen uh, can leave those blank. Uh, yeah. I'd, be, I'd be all right with that. Yeah. If the customer complaining 4473 is unsure of whether they reside in the city limits and marks the wrong box, will the FFL be penalized for the mistake? No. The answer is no. There's mm -hmm. actually an unknown. I don't know, I think it says, right? Yeah, but, but if they answer incorrectly, if, yeah, are they I, mean, I guess are they lying? The answer is probably not, but yeah. unknown is the best answer if they don't know. Um, and if they ask you what if they you know if they ask you because they always will, you say there's an unknown box there. <laughs> yeah. That's the best bet. Uh, you're just going to make life harder on the uh, the next folks who have to figure out who to notify on a denial. Yeah. Uh, customer uses brace firearm with no submitted form yet and has a malfunction that would require gunsmith repair. We could not help anyone anymore without a tax stamp. During the grace period, as I explained, any gunsmith can work on NFA regulated firearms. Yeah. So if someone brings a pistol with a brace on it, can you give the gun back without the brace? Yes. Yes. Yeah, destroy the brace, remove it. That's one of the options that's stated on the ATF guide. If there's a list of braces allowed, is there a list of braces allowed for handicapped persons? The nope. answer is no. You have to send the gun in for uh, design approval to the to, uh, FITB underscore. Uh, I forget the uh, website we had up, but there's a specific website to inquire that with. A little off topic, but on a return of a repaired receiver firearm to the person from which it was acquired is the, is the terminology I find, but does not state anything about the address being different. Oh, okay. As you are aware, many in... Um, the LE community do not have their addresses on their identification. Yeah. I would love to hear your advice on this and the regulations. Yeah. So as it relates to law enforcement who have a state issued ID that has the uh, agency address on it, uh, they're required to actually tell the federal government their true address. So those IDs, if they, if they I declare to you that that's our law enforcement agency address, it's not where I reside then you have to get their real driver's license. Um, the state laws around privacy and law enforcement, et cetera, do not apply in the purchase or transaction transfer of a firearm. 
Yeah, and, and the reason for that is that the ATF wants to know every day where that firearm is in the, in the event they have to go and retrieve it. <coughs> it's going to be the, 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 the transferee's residential permanent address, current address. Yeah. We get that question about once a month. Cops don't think they have to tell you, but they actually do. Okay. On, are iron front and rear sights on any or any sights allowed on, on AR pistols? Are front grips still allowed on them? Front grips were never allowed on AR pistols, only that little 45 degree angle thingy. I forget what they're called. It's called a uh, handguard. Yeah. Well, there's this little attachment you can put on yeah. the handguard that you yeah. know keeps it from, you know, I guess sliding or whatever. Uh front and rear sights, drop down sights are fine as long as they're not intended to be used uh when they're when, if the firearm is fired fired from the shoulder. So um, if, if the intended use is to fire from the shoulder, then no. The front and rear sights, there are front and rear sights on AR pistols. There are front and rear sights on handguns. So yeah. you have to look at the intended use. Yeah. Uh, just a, a follow-up question to something earlier, John. If you're pinning that uh, suppress it to the barrel, yes, that has to be done by a manufacturer. Am I correct? Yes. Not, not, a, not a type one or two. You have to be a type seven. Uh, what are we doing is taking off the braces and discount. The, uh, what we are doing is taking off the braces and discounting the loan. Uh, that's a, a pawnbroker stating that that's great. No problem. You got to get the, but you got to get those braces removed and they, they can't be attached currently. What is keeping the ATF from coming after a typo one for changing a barrel when it's classified as manufactured by the ATF? The uh, ATF in the has, situation of AR pistols there, it's all part of the amnesty period. So you can certainly switch those out per their per their direction. If you read through the 291 pages that's published, you'll see that there's uh, amnesty and um, authorization provided in the ruling to allow you to do that as a result of this new ruling implementation. If the order does knock on my door one morning unannounced, can I turn them away until my lawyer is in the room and I can call you guys? <laughs> no, you can't turn them away. Tur turning them away will get you revoked. And then they'll go and get a subpoena that will require you to allow them access. And they'll show up with a deputy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they're there to catch you with your pants down, as we say. So make sure you're A&D. You know, the first thing they do is count your guns. So make sure everything is acquired and disposed of properly. Same day, next day, or within a seven-day limit if, if allowed by law with business records. All right. Has there been any update to the 88-day rule in reference to this ruling? You know anything about an 88 day rule? I don't know. Nope. Don't know anything about it. 120 days. That may have been something in a prior. In uh, the original? Yeah, yeah. It might have been in the original. So it's yep. 120 days as published. As published today, it's yep. is, is what it is. Yep. The so current publication supersedes all prior publications. Yep, exactly. Back to the private party transfer. Two people come in and one wants to transfer the firearm to the other. If we take the gun into our bound book, have the transferee fill out a 4473, run a background check and transfer the gun, do we still have to check off the private party box? The answer is yes. Yes. Yep. The yep. reason you check that box off and, and what we recommend is that you do not take possession of that firearm until the person purchasing it has been cleared and you receive a proceed. The reason for that is, God forbid that person gets denied and you want to return that firearm to the original owner, that original owner has to fill out a 4473 in the back and go through a background check to get their gun back. If they do not give that possession, the possession of that firearm to you, they maintain possession. They don't have to do a 4473 in a background check if the buyer gets denied. And the reason you check that box off is if that firearm is not listed in your A&D book, but that box is checked, it tells the ATF, that the original owner maintained possession, and therefore that's why there's not an acquisition of that firearm in your Andy records. And again, that all that conversation JC just went over is all about the denial problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have a 4473, that box is checked, but that 4473 is denied, the ATF's not going to find that gun when they go to cross reference your inspection log. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the other issue on that is uh, finally on that, what JC just explained, if that seller of the gun, gives you the gun, you acquire it, and he gets he or she gets denied, then you're stuck with a gun you don't own. And that's a bigger problem. Exactly. Yeah. And then what do you do? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we get that that call happen. We get that once a month. So it's a mess. 
Uh, ATF held the Zoom stated no exemption for handicap for brace for yeah. braces. Here's the deal. Um, and we heard from multiple people that attended multiple of those ATF training sessions. Everyone was slightly different and different things were said. I can tell you, go out to the ATF website. Uh, the language that was in our presentation today all came from ATF. So there are scenarios where a handicapped or disabled person can be in possession of a firearm with a brace on it. But it's going to be specific to the original design and approval. Exactly. So that's why they're saying, if you're one of those folks, send us an email. Yep. Let us say yes or no. All right. Um, during the ATF training WebEx, they stated that the 88-day rule is an FBI rule. Oh, 88-day rule is an FBI rule, and the FBI does not complete the background checks in 88 days. It will most likely deny the Form 1. Oh, John, that 88 days was based on a Form uh, 1 submittal? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, got it. Thank you, uh, Mark. So the answer is um, ATF is hiring 40, 40 people to handle a million Form 1 submissions or more. Uh, a million? <laughs> a million. Yeah. So uh, I guess people are going to be um, tired by the end of this process. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's going to be extended. It's, again, extended through the publication of the, of the recent ruling that that Form 1, as long as you have proof of submittal, is valid for you to um, possess that firearm until denied. Okay, until denied was the key terminology they were phrasing. So, um, so you're not going to get it back in 88 days, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Glad, yeah. glad someone brought this up. I was told by an ATF inspector one time years ago that the firearm is whatever state it's in when sold. Uh, exa SBR, example, SBR removed stock now a pistol. I can sell it over the count as a pistol without any notification to the ATF. He said they would like to be notified, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, if that if that is SB, if that AR pistol is presented to you next year for pawn or used gun purchase, you never have to verify anything. You have no means as an FFL to determine whether or not a firearm was registered uh, as an SBR. If it comes to you in a pistol configuration, then you just know it as a pistol. You don't know that it was ever. I mean, you can certainly ask the question, um, you know, the original individual, and this is the advice of the ATF, the original person that that firearm is registered to, if they so choose to change the configuration or classification of that firearm, they can do so. And there's no requirement for them to notify the NFA. And the reason for that is they may want to change it back to being an NFA firearm. However, the ATF would appreciate being notified of that. And, and all you have to do is send an email request with a copy of the Form 4, or even in a situation where an FFL is in possession, uh, potentially a Form 3, to say, please remove this from the NFRTR. I am changing the classification configuration of the firearm, period. So. Yeah, there's it's no requirements. A, and there's no specific form, so. No, there's no specific form. <laughs> right. Um, JC, well, what's a form for? A form for is a transfer form for NFA firearms between uh, from uh, a licensee uh, to a non-licensee. So uh, you would use a form for if you were selling suppressors. Uh, if selling a suppressor to a non-licensee, a form for would be used to transact that. Yeah, and, and only as any... Uh, FFL dealers who possess a, a special occupation, occupation, C tax stamp, tax, um, yeah. SOT, yeah. you know, they pay $500 a year to have that. Yeah. They're the only ones allowed to process the form for. Um, I'm sorry. Typically, they're the only ones who can work with a client or customer to process a, a form for. Right. And now through this ruling, again, the ATF says any non-SOT holder Right. FFL can actually use have their customers use that process. It's available online to go ahead and submit their form to transfer that SBR that may be in very confusing now, maybe in a, a non SOT gun dealer who registered on a form one because they had it, you know, as of January 31st. They said, oh, I'm going to keep it as is. I want to sell these in the future. They're, you know, people will want them. Uh, but you got to now, if you sell them, you got to use this form four process that you really don't understand yet. You can, you know, uh, get together with us and we can show you and teach you and train you um, how to do this because you don't know how to do it. But they say, that's how you do it. And we haven't told you how to do it. So you go learn on yourself and do it right, hopefully. And it costs $200 for that customer to buy that from you anyway. 
So it's a mess. Uh, we're saying if you're not an SOT dealer, take the braces off. Don't bring any more in and don't deal with this until this gets clarified uh, through litigation and maybe repealed. So it's a very, you can go online and read more about Form 4s, but they're very specific on, you know, for suppressors, people buying machine guns, show up our rifles and that type of firearm. All right, on the current 4470, well, we have, we have a, um, a, a, a hard cutoff very soon, but we got just five or six more questions I see. On the current 4473s, 21112 and 2112, and the customer is a U.S. citizen, are both these numbers left blank? That's the oh, version okay. May, the May 2020 version. Uh, no, one of those needs, to, if they're a U.S. citizen, they still need to answer 21.L.1. Oh, there, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that first one on the current form should be still checked with a no. Yeah. All right, so if you're question. still using that May 2020 version, then yes, you still have to answer those questions. Yeah. Or the first question. There yeah. you go. All right. And SBR form one has been submitted and approved. And then after the fact, the realization has been that the model and overall, overall, overall length is wrong. What do you do? Uh, you not contact the NFA division and ask them to update the uh, form four or form one. Uh, and they'll resend it to you. Uh, and that happens too with some suppressors. The Smith & Wesson owns Gentech, yeah. you know? So, yeah, so you contact your NFA branch and reference your uh, Form 1 or Form 4 application. Uh, please clarify the buffer tube with lo location notches regarding a uh, pistol. Can the buffer tube on a pistol have adjustment notches? We answered yes. Can the buffer tube be longer than 6.5 inches? Thanks. The average length of the buffer tube is six to six point five inches. It'd be unusual to have, you know, an eight-inch buffer tube. Again, it's 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 designed for the essential functionality of the firearm. Uh, so as long as it has is designed for that purpose, has spring and uh, recoil uh, mechanisms in place inside that buffer tube, I would assume that it's okay, uh, JC. And um, the we already know that the adjustable notches and um, spines, et cetera that are um, you know, affixed to some of these or you know, manufactured into some of these, they're okay again, as long as the functionality is essential to the firearm, the uh, buffer tube functionality, All right? I have ordered youth handgun forms three times since November and received zero, good question, don't know. You can always call the ATF distribution center as well. Yeah, they have a phone number on that same site you can call. Yep. Uh, uh, do, you have, do you have to put the date in 27C even if you are kind, the kind of dealer that doesn't transfer a gun without an approval. Yes, you're required to complete the form in its entirety, even and if you 20, don't transfer the firearm. And 27C is the um, first notification um, right. notice. Yes. Uh, so a delay. Now, some states don't give you an initial response for a few days. Yep. The state of Washington and some others. Um, so you don't fill in that, that date. Uh, or check that box. You don't just because they didn't give you an answer today doesn't mean it was a delay. Uh, be careful in some of those states. What you and you guys know who you are. Uh, the ruling has been the ATF ad, uh, advisement has been that you leave those blank until you get the quote unquote first initial response based on your ATF uh, your background check submittal. Okay. Um, can you permanent? Can a permanent resident apply for an SBR form? Sure. Or permanent permanent residents are the are no different than a citizen of the U.S. Yep. They are not okay. required. They are not a non-immigrant alien because they, as permanent residents, are immigrant aliens. Yep. John, your forty-five degree uh, angled plastic piece is called a hand stop. Oh, very nice. Thank you for that yeah. nomenclature information. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Way to go, guys. That's why we're together. Uh, do buffer tubes with the foam attached fall under the ruling? The answer is yes, they're okay again, as long as they're essential to the functionality of the firearm. And, uh, you know, if they're removable, remove them. If they slide off, slide off. If they're glued in place, leave them where they are. Um, it does not make them into an SBR unless you have surface area for shouldering the firearm. As a manufacturer, what defense do I have from some idiot doing stupid stuff? I love these <laughs> questions. And posting it to social media that it is against from the design intent of the firearm. Um, anyway, uh, as a manufacturer, what does, oh, okay. So if you're a manufacturer, what defense do I have as a manufacturer for some idiot posting social media that it's against the design and intent of the firearm? So 
I think you I think you can report them. I think you can try to contact that that customer with a social media post. I think you can try to have conversation with them. I don't think you just um, you know start to shun them or blast them. I mean that just turns into a social media nightmare. Try 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 to go for some education. Point them to us. We can we 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 talk to customers all day long about how to buy guns, et cetera. They call. Unfortunately, we have a a Google listing. Any chance you can please send us a copy of the PowerPoint I joined late and got the end of the 4473 changes. I know next week we will be, we will get the recorded webinar. Sure. Oh yeah, got you, RJ. I'll send that out today. Anybody else who wants a just a PowerPoint, uh, I'm actually going to go list that. I'm going to go put this on our website today, uh, before five o'clock. It'll be available on our website at the bottom. You can find just download this PowerPoint right from there. I'm not going to send it out to you. Um, I think a couple, I have some 4473s where the customers may have misspelled the name or wrote the wrong number of their address. I just have them draw a line through it and initial and date the correction. Will I be non-compliant with these corrections? No, that's exactly how you're supposed to make those corrections. Yep. You, if you it's after the correct. firearm was transferred, you're required to do it on a photocopy. But if it's done prior to the firearm being transferred, it's a single line, initial and date the corrections. If they made the correction, then they initial and date. Yep. Before the firearms transfer, do it on the form. After the firearms been transferred, you have to photocopy the page in question and attach it. Do we have to give a Youth Handgun Safety Act pamphlet with the sale of a handgun or pistol? Yes, Absolutely. every handgun or pistol sale. Every sale with a handgun or pistol. If you're returning it to someone other than the person you received it from. Correct. You must not only give them the pamphlet, it must be accompanied by a locking device, safety device including used guns. People don't realize that. If you're selling a used gun, you better provide a lock for it Yep. and a, and a pamphlet and have the sign posted. Yep. Uh, ATF is, is definitely checking all of that as part of their inspection process nowadays. How would I really like to see them take a, uh, make a thick line on 18 A and B as people constantly overlook these, these in two separate questions? Should not be too difficult Talk to make. Talk about the ethnicity and race question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you can certainly submit that as a response to the Federal Register when they publish the, you know, the new 4473 out there. Uh, it's out there right now and still available for you to make comments for. So, all right, guys, we're really make that recommendation. Okay, listen, kudos. Absolutely love you guys. Uh, let's see how many JC we still have. Just love you guys. 115 of you. Big round of applause. I want you to write this down because you stayed to the end. We're not going to, I'm going to take this out of the edit, right? Just write this down. Free 90, free 90. That's going to be a code word. We're launching a training platform uh, very soon and we'll give you 90 days of free access to it for your employees. Hope you guys um, are there. When we launch, you'll get a notification. Everybody else is going to have to pay money. Unfortunately, is spending a lot of money trying to get this thing up for you guys. Free 90, uh, you guys win. That's your bonus for staying late. Got any questions, reach out to us. We love you um, and stay safe and uh, stay inspection ready every day. Any, anything else, JC? No, that's it. Y'all have a good one. I'm headed back east for another revocation hearing. All right, guys. Two of them this week. Avoid that revocation. I want to come see you, but not under those circumstances. <laughs> right, right, right. All right. Thanks all. Have a great week. See you next month. All right, y'all. Bye.